this past weekend, I took a quick two day trip out to the Badlands. It was just kind of a little time to retreat and to just refresh, recharge. And also for uh, photographic opportunities, it was no moon, clear sky, except for all of the haze and stuff. And I had this picture that I wanted to get. Um, this, this feast that Jesus is at, the Feast of Tabernacles, it's celebrating coming out of Israel, the whole Exodus journey being led through the wilderness, we, we saw last week when he was talking about the streams of living water, how it was kind of tying into that last great feast or part of the feast where they were celebrating Moses's drawing water from the rock. The feast is over and Jesus is now going to start talking to the people. And the first thing he's going to say is that I am the light of the world. And that was another thing that they celebrated was that as they were being led through the wilderness, God led them by a pillar of fire at night, this pillar of light, or a cloud by day. And I'm going to see if this works. Um, oh, I got to do this part first. This hey. is the picture that this is the picture that I got. Ooh, mm -hmm. wow. It's, you want to see it, honey? Look at that. Yeah. Beautiful. And that's the image that, that came to mind for me was being led by the light at night, that beautiful, brilliant Milky Way. Oh, that's gorgeous. Where was it taken? In the Badlands. Oh, gosh, beautiful. Just south of Wall, South Dakota. Mm -hmm. This was actually looking from where I was spending the night. I spent the night sleeping in the back of my truck along a ledge and <laughs> looking out over the Badlands, and that's what I got to see. Mm. Thank you. But now back to, rea it's back to reality. <laughs> oh, but that's, yeah. that's the image that I want us to have while we're going through this, because Jesus is talking about being the light of the world. And he's talking to especially the religious leaders who were living in darkness. They did not understand. They couldn't understand. So who would like to read verse 12 through 20 for me? Go for it, Marilyn. All right. I've got the uh, New American Standard. Uh, 12 through 20, uh, chapter 8. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You are bearing witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not where I, know where I come from or where I am going. You people judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I and he who sent me. Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who bears witness of myself and the father who sent me bears witness of me. And so they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know, neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Thank you. Here we start to see Jesus again confronting the Pharisees. And this is going to be a theme now from here to the end of this whole interaction before his crucifixion. As he's going to start to hammer on them more and more and more. And really it's, it's twofold. He's trying to get them to understand who he is. But more importantly, starting to set up the separation between himself 
and this current regime of religious leaders to show the hypocrisy that they have, but also to start to help his disciples, and especially that group of 12, to understand that when he's gone, it cannot be business as usual. That the temptation would be to fall back into the trap of just allowing the Pharisees to run the show and allow them to continue to lead people astray. And what Jesus is going to do is really draw a line in the sand and tell his disciples that, no, that is not the way to do this. So he's confronting them directly. And it's this interesting argument where he's talking about, I'm the light of the world. And the Pharisee's response is, that means nothing. It's not valid. Your testimony about yourself isn't valid. You know, in according to their law, you needed two people in order to validate any sort of testimony. And so they're getting really picky here with Jesus. And they're saying, well, that's just your word. Where's the proof? Where's that other person to validate this? And Jesus said, I don't need that. I don't need that other validation because I know where I came from. My father, God, is that other validation. They're not understanding. But I love how he says, if you knew the father, you'd know me. And if you knew me, you would know the father. And this is going to really get underneath the skin of the Pharisees because they're still thinking about this whole idea in human terms, fleshly terms. And Jesus is starting to talk on a much higher plane. He's starting to talk on a spiritual plane. And they simply do not understand. Who would like to read 21 through 30 for me? Susan, go for it. Again, he said to them, I go away and you will seek me and die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself since he says where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. They said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, even what I have told you from the beginning, I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world that I have heard from him, what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak thus as the Father taught me. Then he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what is pleasing to him. As he spoke thus, many believed in him. Thanks, I find it fascinating that he never comes out and directly answers their question. Yeah. <laughs> the ultimate politician, <laughs> tap dancing around it. As I said, who are you? What an opportunity for him to stand up and say, I am the Messiah. I am the one that you have been waiting for. What do you think would have happened had he done that? Put him in the loony bin. <laughs> yeah. I'd say half would believe and half would dispute it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Kind of normal. Well, and it drives people into a yes or no position. 
So they're stuck there. You know, they start arguing one way or the other rather than oh, mm -hmm. just changes their approach. Hypothetically, what would have happened if he said that and the religious leaders believed him? Mm. He wouldn't have been crucified. Oh, <laughs> yes, Helen. And you broke no your ascension. arm, but not your brain. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah, and then no ascension. If no, if no crucifixion, then no ascension. Yeah. yeah. Right. No resurrection. Right. I mean, I mean resurrection. I'm sorry, resurrection. Yeah. And ascension. Yeah. And no. the sending of the Holy Spirit. None of that would have happened. But that's why he came. So all of that stuff would happen. Again, they went to arrest him, but no one did because it wasn't his time. He's he's got this timing down. And he wasn't going to let anything get in the way. So here, when they're asking him that direct question, here was his great opportunity to say, yeah, here I am. He's already done that a couple of times. He's let people know who he is. But he doesn't let the religious leaders know. He leaves it for them to try to figure out on their own mostly because they need to be the ones to pull the trigger and crucify him. And also, he understands that their hearts simply cannot accept the truth of his testimony. And that's harsh. Think about that. The religious leaders, the ones in charge of leading people to God, the ones in charge of worship, the ones in charge of this whole idea of sacrifice and forgiveness, the ones in charge of teaching everybody else about God, were simply unable to grasp the truth. Ouch. Ouch. Sadly, that's still true today in a lot of ways. Sometimes we're simply unable to grasp the truth because so many other things get in the way. We have our own agendas. We have our own understandings of the way things should be. We have our own desires and wishes. We have our own pride that keeps us from hearing as God speaks. And that's so true here of the Pharisees. They had their pride. This is the way things had been done. This is the way that they had chosen to do things. Even though they knew the scriptures that pointed to the coming of the Messiah, they couldn't recognize that that was Jesus because he didn't fit their mold. He did not fit the mold of what their Messiah should look like. He's not supposed to be this guy who comes in wandering around, followed by all of these outcasts and sinners. That wasn't what they were looking for. They were looking for a political leader who was going to come riding in on a white horse and kick out Rome. They were looking for political salvation. The idea of spiritual salvation wasn't even on the agenda for them because they didn't think they needed it. You know, again, that still holds true today. That's one of the stumbling blocks that so many people have about this idea of Jesus and salvation and sin. They're firmly convinced that, number one, they're not sinners. <laughs> number two, they don't need to be saved. Because number three, there is no judgment. There is nothing else. 
this is it. Life is here to be lived as we want to live it. And when it's over, it's done. We become worm fodder, and that's the end of the story. So the idea of having a need for a savior is ludicrous to some people. Just as the idea of Jesus being the Messiah made no sense to the Pharisees. So they're going to push at him. And they love how he's simply going to push back. But in the process, many people are going to be listening and watching. And many people are going to put their faith in him. Who would like to read verse 31 through 41 for me? Go for it, Diane. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we should be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I've seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your Father. Am I supposed to keep going? No. I find this interesting. He's talking to the people who believed in him. These were the ones who were following they said okay we think you're him we think that you're who you say you are and he starts to push on them as well saying that if you hold to my truth the truth will set you free which is a powerful statement because the truth will set you free They took it as being a literal freedom. They said, we're Abraham's descendants. We're not a slave to anybody. And Jesus says, you're a slave to sin. And when we talk about sin, um, again, I go back to that definition that I like. The middle letter of the word I, S-I-N. <laughs> It's that self-centeredness. It's that desire to have things our way. We want to have what we want, when we want it, and we don't care what the consequences are in the moment. We just want it. We want our way. It's that life that's lived for self, not for God. And it's funny how we as human beings can justify our behavior so many ways. Even though we know it's wrong, we can still justify it. The Pharisees were great at that. And their followers were great at that. And what Jesus is saying here is, just because you are Abraham's descendants does not set you apart. You don't get a special get out of jail free card because you're Abraham's descendants. You are still a slave to sin. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But they don't get it. They talk about Abraham being their father. So it's interesting how their allegiance changes 
over time. They first started talking about being Moses's children. <laughs> Moses is who we follow. Now they're switching it, going to Abraham. They're just reaching for all of the big guns. They're pulling out all of the patriarchs saying, we don't know about you. We don't know where you came from. We don't know really even what you're trying to say. We're going to stick to what we know. We know Abraham. We know Moses. And Jesus is going to blow that argument out of the water. Um, let's go. Let's go back and reread verse 40 and go through 47, please. In fact, let's do 39, 39 through 47. Catherine? <clears throat> Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and now am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Now, this was directed not just to the religious leaders. This was directed to those people who believed in him and were following him. It's kind of reminiscent of when he started talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And so many people walked away saying, this is really hard. I, I can't follow this. I don't understand it. And now again, he's, he's telling them, the people who are believing and following, that your father isn't God. Your father is the devil. Ouch is right. <laughs> Nobody wants to be told that they are children of Satan. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I shouldn't say nobody. There might be some people who might be happy to know that they're children of Satan. <laughs> but for the most part, these are people who had faith, professed to be followers of God. Some were their leaders and some were the people in the congregation sitting in the pews. And Jesus is saying, you don't know the truth. You can't know the truth. Because your father is the father of lies. And that is so true. I mean, you, you think about it. When Satan first shows up on the scene in scripture, he's in the garden. And what's the first thing that he says? When he's tempting Eve to eat the fruit. And she's going, oh, no, God says we can't do that. And Satan's response is fascinating. He said, did God really say that? Did God really tell you not to do that? Yeah. 
planting that seed of doubt. That seed of unbelief. That's how he operates. He plants those seeds of doubt. He gets us to question, what does God really mean? Did God really say that? And by doing that, he starts to drive this wedge between God and humanity. He starts to drive this wedge between us and God. Because we start to think about faith in terms of just our heads and what our heads can wrap around. No difference than what the Pharisees were doing. No different than what the people he's talking to here were doing. If it doesn't make logical sense, then we're not going to believe it. We're not going to trust it. But Jesus is stepping outside of all of that. And he's planting this seed, this idea that faith looks different. He's kind of laying a foundation. He's not going to dump on them all at once because, A, they couldn't understand it. And, B, it wasn't the right time. But he's going to start to lay the stones at the foundation of faith. He's tearing down what they believed in the first place. He's going to tear down that system of, of sacrifice and ritual and obeying all of the rules. And he's going to rebuild that on a foundation of trust and faith. Love. Love for God, love for one another. That's the foundation of faith. And that's going to take some time. It's going to ruffle a lot of feathers. In fact, so many so that they're going to kill him for it. But when it's all over and the disciples are sitting around being filled with the Holy Spirit and watching people come to faith, they're going, ah, that's what this was all about. The people struggled with that. But we still struggle with that today because we want instant fixes, right? <laughs> when we have a problem, we want it to be fixed instantly. We don't like this idea of God taking his time to work in us. <laughs> we don't like this idea of, of God just slowly rebuilding us. We want it to happen right away. I don't think he works that way as often as we wish he would. Sometimes he will. But for the most part, if he's going to rebuild a system of belief, it's going to happen slowly, methodically, powerfully. And when we get to the other side of it, we're going to go, oh, yeah, why did we ever do it that way? Excuse me just a second. But he closes it out in verse 47 by saying probably some of the harshest words in Scripture. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. How would you like to have that sentence hanging over your head? Especially when you're firmly convinced that God is speaking to you and you alone. Suddenly now, here comes this Jesus saying, you can't hear because you don't belong to God. To me, this is kind of the turning point. This is where he starts to really, really, really separate himself. He knows his time is short. 
He knows that in just a little while, it's going to be crucifixion time. And he's not going to spend a whole lot of time trying to convince the religious leaders that things should be different. He's not even going to spend a whole lot of time trying to convince the people who are believing in him that things should be different. What he's going to do is spend a lot of time convincing them that they are broken and that they are in need of a savior. And that's what he's doing here. Who would like to read 48 through, let's go to 58. Vita, go for it. <clears throat> the Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I have not a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he will be the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died as did the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me of whom you say that he is your God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I said, I do not know him, I should be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews then said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Thank you. Thank you. Now they think he's a raving lunatic. <laughs> yeah. First, they, they call him a Samaritan, which is, as we saw earlier with the woman at the well, an outcast. And then they say he's possessed by a demon because he's teaching and saying things that they don't like to hear. So what's our first response when somebody says something that we don't like? We call them names. <laughs> especially things that can invalidate their testimony or their words. You don't know what you're talking about. And then he has this audacity to start talking about seeing Abraham. And how Abraham rejoiced in seeing him. And their response was, you're not even 50 years old. How can you claim you saw Abraham? Again, you're, you're a nutcase, Jesus. And Jesus responds. He says, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. Another time of Jesus saying the name of God. Yeah. At this point, the people have had enough. Now this is blasphemy. He's saying that he is equal to God. So they pick up stones to kill him because that was the death sentence for blasphemy. Even though they weren't allowed by the Romans to put anybody to death. They were so angry. They were so livid that they were willing to forget about the law, not just their own Mosaic law, but the Roman law. 
and they were going to kill Jesus because of what he'd said. He's simply speaking the truth. They don't know that. Because again, they're so locked into seeing things on a physical plane. Before Abraham was, Jesus was. <laughs> Jesus was there from the very beginning of things. The pre-incarnate Christ that was in heaven with Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the pre-incarnate Christ that we saw in the beginning of John that was intimately involved in the creation. All of that was taking place long before Abraham showed up on the scene. <laughs> Jesus was. And to use God's name, it's linking himself with the Father in that mystical union of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. More or less what Jesus said here was that, you want to know who I am? I'm God. Just the thing to say to a crowd of people who, number one, think you're nuts, now you're demon-possessed, now you're an outcast. You've been calling them names, you've been poking at them, and now you're claiming to be God. Is it any wonder that was their response? <laughs> Jesus has accomplished his goal. He's gotten the people so worked up that they will have no choice but to kill him when the time is right. Because he knows that's the ultimate purpose. And now we're going to see shift gears a little bit, and we are going to see the, I guess the event would be the best word. The event that the Pharisees are going to use to eventually bring Jesus in and fire justice at him. So who would like to read in chapter 9, verses 1 through... 12 for me, please. Susan, go for it. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night comes when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. As he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes with the clay, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He said, I am the man. They said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made play and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. I love this. It's answering an age old question that the Jews had. When something bad had happened to a person, it was seen as being a judgment from God, a punishment for sin. Funny, again, we, we still think that today. <laughs> you know, something happens to somebody and quite often the first words out of their mouth is, why is God doing this to me? I thought God loved me. Yeah, that's, that's our human nature. Mm, right here. Yeah. Yeah. 
But Jesus answered their question. They say, who, who, who sinned, this guy or his parents, that he's blind? And Jesus said something that we struggle with sometimes today. He said, neither. This is not a punishment for sin. This guy was born this way so the glory of God might be on display. In other words, this guy was a beggar having a really tough life just waiting for this moment. Does that seem fair? No. No, it doesn't, does it? God allowed this guy to be blind all of his life so he could do something later. That just shows our narrow focus as human beings. It really, it really does. People look at this and say, that's not fair for God. How mean, how cruel to punish this guy all of his life just so God could show off. Because in essence, that's what it is on the surface. But if we only look at the things of Scripture on the surface, then we only look at them through our lens, our filter, what we think is just and fair. Because that's what we do as humans. We look at events and we filter them through our own understanding, our own take on things, our own beliefs and values and judgments. And we continue to do that even today. You know, we look back on so many things that used to be seen as being okay and the norm. And we look at them now and we say, that's not right. I'll use the example of slavery. It used to be seen as being okay for some people. We look on it now and say, that's not right, even though there were many people who were using scripture to justify owning other human beings. But we look back on that and say, that was wrong. There are other things that we look back on and we say, hmm, that was wrong too. Go back and look through magazines from the 40s and 50s and even into the early 60s. How many cigarette ads are there? Even have doctors claiming that this was a good thing. Now we look back and say, that was wrong. <laughs> Hindsight is always 2020, except when it comes to the things of God. Because when we look at this, in that moment, it just seems wrong. Because again, we're looking at it through our eyes, through our focus, through our lens. And Jesus is saying here, there is a bigger purpose at play. God was not only going to be glorified through this guy getting sight. This was going to be the trigger that eventually got Jesus crucified. I kind of look at it this way. When I was a kid, I liked to play dominoes. I didn't play it the right way. You know, you line up the numbers and everything. I just got as many dominoes as I could find, and I lined them all up and just on top like that, standing upright, make a design or a display, and take my finger and go, boink, and watch all of those other dominoes fall down. God has been at work since the beginning of creation. 
lining up all of those dominoes. And when Jesus healed this man, it's like God took his finger and went, boink. And all of those dominoes are going to fall into place. And the design that's going to show up at the end of it all is going to be the cross. Someday I want to get enough dominoes and I want to get a big enough room and I want to set them all up and get it formed up so it forms this beautiful cross. And I want to turn on a movie camera and go boink and just watch them all fall down and fall into place because that's the image that I have here. This isn't about this man. This isn't even about the healing. This is about God taking his finger and going poink and starting to knock down all of those dominoes that have been lined up that are ultimately going to lead to Jesus' crucifixion. I love how the people respond to this. Are you really him? Are you really healed? Can you really see? Who did this to you? He's honest and he says, the one they call Jesus opened my eyes. The one they call Jesus opened my eyes. And this is going to lead to a marvelous interaction between Jesus and the religious leaders. And it's going to be leading to marvelous interactions for the next 2,000 years after this. The one they call Jesus opens our eyes. And I'm going to stop there because this is a good breaking point for this week. And we're out of time, so I guess that's a good enough place to stop. <laughs> Any comments, questions? Vita? It, it sure seems like it would have been easy enough to start believing in Jesus when he was performing miracles, you know, and especially if you saw some of the miracles happen. But this telling people who are believers, you know, that, um, well, you, sorry, you're son of Satan and you, just, <laughs> you, you don't believe. <laughs> I That would have been hard, I think, to keep believing, to make that turn, to follow him regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes following Jesus is tough. Think of the faith it took for this guy. He'd gotten used to his life, just like the beggar at the pool, gotten used to his life. And Jesus tells you to do something that makes absolutely no sense. I'm going to put some mud on your eyes, and then I want you to go to the pool and wash it off. It's one of those myriad of acts of faith that are all through the scriptures. It doesn't seem like a big deal. But it's huge because this was a life changing event for this guy. If it worked, his life would no longer be the same. He wouldn't be a beggar anymore. He'd have to actually rely on himself to feed and clothe and take care of himself. He would no longer get that attention. Life would be different. It's going to get him out of his comfort zone. Worst case scenario is he goes and washes himself and nothing happens. What's that going to do to his faith? Yeah, there's a guy who's been waiting for something for all of his life. And that something shows up and you think you found it. And you think you could put your trust in it. And it's gone. 
it took great courage to simply do what Jesus told them to do. And that, my friends, is great. Great words to live by. It takes courage to do what Jesus tells us to do. Big things, little things, mundane things, things that make absolutely no sense. Washing some mud off your eyes makes no sense. Believing that a guy dies and comes out of the grave and goes up to heaven and somehow that's going to forgive my sins. It takes a lot of faith to believe that. Now I'm going to stop talking <laughs> and leave that with you till next week. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Bye. Thanks, Bye. 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 Bye.